Today on The Intelligent Asset, a discussion on leveraging artificial intelligence in asset-intensive enterprises. Welcome to The Intelligent Asset, a podcast on digitizing, enterprise asset management, developing intelligent interactions, and building systems of intelligence for asset operations. For industry professionals who work in EAM and facilities management across transport, public sector, utilities, manufacturing, and large enterprises. We want to tie the global challenges we all share to the world of EAM and how we can make change for the better, building a more sustainable collective future. And this episode is brought to you by IBM Maximo, Australasia's leading provider of sustainability solutions for asset-intensive enterprises. I'm Sam Williams, one of the hosts on The Intelligent Asset, and today we are joined by Roy Lawrenson. Such a pleasure to have you with us. Roy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, no, great to be here. Um, so yeah, my name's Roy Lorenzen. I'm a solution manager uh, here at Certus. I've been with Certus for the last 16 years, um, done a range of, uh, of different roles within, within Certus itself, uh, focusing in um, about 10, 12 years ago in and around the mobility side of things. A sort of broadening it out now into into some of the other spaces, particularly in around AI and, and how that can help uh, help businesses. Great. And so you have a little bit of experience in terms of the application of artificial intelligence in the in the asset intensive and EAM space. Yeah. So yeah, most most people kind of think that mobility is was always kind of the start of of AI. It's all about kind of data and gathering data and how that data can then help. Um, feed information and or decisions that are kind of being made. So mobility for me, well, from my perspective, was really the start of that and kind of enabling that interaction between data that may have been collected in the past and being able to kind of make a decision uh, here in the here and now, but also be able to collect data for decisions to be made in the future. And there's very much around uh, along those same, similar lines to what AI can do. And I guess with a lot of hype in recent times about generative AI, um, are there perspectives that you bring to the, the table in terms of more structured environments like enterprise asset management and some of the risks that might be associated with the application of AI? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's numerous risks that are that are involved with with kind of bringing that in. Uh, one of the biggest ones is is obviously the trust factor. So kind of being able to trust AI in terms of what it is is sort of being able to tell you, but also kind of the use of it um, in a broader spec as well. And everybody kind of fears the machines, uh, the robots rising up and and taking over the world. So there's always that kind of big trust factor that's there. The other thing is around is AI is only as good as its trainer, essentially. So like humans, it's only as good as basically the training that it's received um, to, in order to be able to, to make those decisions and the quality of the data that it has um, uh, from that aspect as well. So there's some real uh, risks a- around it. Um, as long as we understand what they are, um, we're able to kind of put plans in place to be able to mitigate those. And on the flip side of of the risk, what are some of the um, substantive gains that uh, are possible? Yeah, I mean, one thing that AI is really, really good at being able to do is analyze, um, optimize, automate um, data and process. So really kind of saving a lot of time um, you know, for, for a human to have to go and, and trawl through 12, uh, 10, 12, 20 years worth of data to understand patterns and, and see what's kind of happening can take a long time. AI with the right kind of training um, enables, it enables you to be able to kind of do that in some near real time. So there's real benefits, particularly in and around the predictive maintenance side of things. So being able to kind of streamline your maintenance processes to make, make it more predictive rather than um, schedule time um, uh, based but also kind of running around some of the automation of some particular tasks. So the use of robots, drones, um, that sort of thing, to be able to send those to areas where um, it is unsafe or potentially unsafe uh, to send people to um, is obviously it has a big impact from a safety perspective as, as well, but also kind of the near real-time monitoring of, of the safety um, elements around as well. We kind of talk about... 
um, you know, having sensors on on our uh, operators and things like that. So understanding if they may have had a fall or if they're kind of going into a sort of a dangerous zone, that sort of thing. So being able to sort of bring that sort of AI technology into the fore um, has some real big uh, benefits. And, and we're seeing quite a bit of that, particularly in the safety side of things, um, but also see, starting to see a lot more in and around the sort of the predictive maintenance and the automation of process. Right. And <clears throat> what would you say the general state of adoption of AI is across Australasia's asset intensive industries? Would you say that we're on the bleeding edge? The um, are, are we behind the curve? What are your thoughts in, in terms of adoption rates? And I, I, I think publicly we're probably behind. So uh, you know there hasn't been a lot of public acknowledgement of success stories or things that have kind of gone from there. I mean, you, there is, you know, you look in, in America and in Europe, there's some big success stories that are coming out, uh, particularly in the utility sector and mining. Um, in Australasia, I think we, which us kind of a bit behind, I, I guess we're a bit shy in terms of basically promoting out some of the successes that we've sort of had. But we certainly know of quite a few organisations that are, are starting to look in this space and, and um, start to drive a bit of innovation around it. But I think we're just a bit behind the, the eight ball when it kind of comes to telling successful stories or, or being able to provide case studies around where it is really working. And and from the point of view of lower order uh, application of things like machine learning and analytics, you know how how advanced would you say collectively the industry is around the utilisation of some of those lower order? Yeah, and a similar story really, um, particularly you know in Australasia where we are. I think the biggest thing is that we've 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 got a lot of data but we're not really sure about the quality of it. So before we kind of are diving deep into, hey, let's start to, to utilize this data, you know, that trust factor kind of comes in, right? Can we trust this data that we've collected on pieces of paper like 20 odd years ago? And the reality is we probably don't need to worry about that stuff. Let's just worry about kind of the things that we've collected in the last two to five years and use that to then start to train, um, train models and, and then start to really get an understanding around what our true picture could look like, do some small pilot projects, understand, iterate, learn, and then kind of expand out from there. So uh, I think that's kind of you know one of the reasons as to why we're sort of sitting sitting back a little bit and just kind of waiting to see um, and almost waiting for models to come to us around, hey, utilize this model to provide you with a with a good model for predictive maintenance in a gas turbine, for example. I just wanted to pick up on a point that you made there around uh, the amount of data that there is and that there's reasonable data sets to work with. I guess my impression is that there are, that especially in New Zealand, uh, that we don't have access to vast amounts of data uh, in the same way as you might in really large scale deployments in, let's say, North America or Europe. Um, <clears throat> Is that sort of is data scarcity a problem in this context? I don't. I don't think scarcity is a problem. Um, you know, the the real thing is kind of it's the quality of the data, right? Making sure that you've you've got good quality data uh, that is complete, and that then enables you to be able to to do the analysis on it and actually get the right um, right level of outcome or, or get the right decisions to be able to be made. Having you know twenty twenty years of Re, you know, reasonable data, but two years of good quality data. I take the two years of good quality data um, anytime um, over that in that type of scenario. So it's more about quality than it is around quantity, I guess, in this instance. And some other examples of uh, where uh, organizations are applying AI, and, and one that kind of comes to mind is you have an aging workforce. That is, uh, you know, moving out or moving into retirement, and moving out, and you have a younger workforce coming in. Talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, what AI has to offer in the in the place or space of experience 
you know, 25 years worth of experience. Yes, and what it comes, I, I guess, where, where it really kind of comes to play is is that searchability again, kind of knowing knowing what it's got. So, you know, Chat GPT is is kind of you know, there's lots of in the news around it. So, having that ability to kind of be able to ask a question and get a response, and then be able to refine that response. So that's where some of these AI tools can really kind of come into play is that ability for it to be able to go look at a whole bunch of data and it might be, you know, the records that you've captured over the last, you know, two, five years around how you would do a particular thing. You know, we always used to kind of talk about you know, the, the phone a friend sort of example. So the ability about it to go, pick up the phone and call Fred who'd been working on this machine for 20 years and knows everything about it. Well, when Fred isn't available to, to answer the phone, you know, where do you kind of go to? And it's it's sort of going to be that um, AI sort of ability to be able to go look at data, ask questions, refine your um, questions to then be able to kind of get a, a good um, answer from there and then be able to make a decision based on that. So not have it tell you kind of that this is it, but you still have to have enough knowledge to be able to understand if that is a good answer or not. I guess that's one thing around AI that people kind of tend to forget is it's only as good as the data set it's got. It's only as good as the training it's got. Somebody still has to validate um, whether or not that's a, that is a good good response. Talk to us a little bit about uh, the foundational uh, processes or um, services that you you need to have in place to to actually effectively take advantage of AI. You know, this is even predating the application of it. Like, what are the things that you need to have in have in order? Um, I think the main the main thing to kind of have and to sort of be able to take advantage of of AI is you have to have a clear objective around what it is you're actually trying to do. Um, because if you don't really understand what it is you're trying to do, you can't then evaluate whether or not AI is actually going to be the answer to your problem or part of the answer to to the problem or the objective that you're actually trying to trying to understand. So, if you if you kind of haven't done some of the groundwork around what are we trying to achieve, is AI actually going to be a fit for it? Can we can we as a business under uh, drop be able to actually do that change? Right? Does that actually um, make sense for us to be able to do? Do we have the technology um, to be able to kind of do that? So it really is quite a big planning phase that uh, that needs to be done to really understand what is you're trying to do, whether or not the technology is av- available to do it. Do you have the skills in house, or do we need to kind of bring those sort of in? before you then embark on the actual um, project itself to, to then bring AI, AI in and probably then start with a small project in terms of basically a little pilot or something like that to then help kind of bring bring all of that in. The key kind of parts is around kind of making sure that you can be, I guess, you know, agile world kind of is, is what we sort of are starting to live in at the moment. So it's kind of about that flexibility and adaptability to be able to bring in a new piece of technology to, to solve a problem for you. And probably understanding that it's a business problem you're trying to solve, not an IT um, a problem that you're trying to solve. So IT will help, but it's really is you're wanting, you're wanting IT to help or AI to come in to help solve business problems rather than IT problems. And, and I guess in asset-intensive environments, that tends to be about moving up the asset management maturity curve correct yeah so being able to really bring yourself up that maturity curve so again you know kind of come from those inspections or prevent and maintenance routines which are very much fixed in stone to something which is more predictive around sort of what it is that you're able to do so again saving you time and money in that sense that you're not sending somebody to the same place every three months when you know you might need to send them there after month five and then month seven and then and so on and so forth as we go from there. Um, and sort of really enabling them, enabling, I guess, the data to help feed some of those decisions around what you've, uh, about when you actually go out to visit assets. Super. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and check out the next episode in the Intelligent Asset. Thanks.